have spoken about the three components of the SIB product. Could you talk a bit in uh, the details about that uh, three components? What, um, for example, what about venture capital? Um, they're required to in invest half a million dollars into venture capital, but is it risky? How risky is it? Uh, how do how does um, Mollis Australia manage the risk of this pro uh, f product? Sure, that's probably the number one question we get asked by investors. So when we typically meet an SRV investor, um, for many of them, it's the first investment they've made outside of their home country or in Australia. Uh, for many of them, it's a new experience to even invest with a fund manager to give their money to a third party fund manager to manage on their behalf. So for them, it's, it's uh, something that they need to be comfortable with. And they have to do a, many investors will typically do a lot of research and due diligence on on the person they choose to manage their investment, which is very important. So if we look at each of the components uh, separately, uh, let's start with VC. Now, as you mentioned, there can be a perception that the VC or venture capital or private equity component is high risk and you're investing in early stage and startup companies and so on. And it's true that the venture capital is the riskier component of the complying investment framework. You know, these investments are in companies which are growing, uh, but they're not liquid. They're not like shares on the stock market that you can buy and sell easily. So it's very important that when you invest in them, you spend a lot of time doing due diligence on the company, on the management, on the idea that the company or the product of the company produces. Um, so that's something that our VC team would spend typically, you know, three, four or, or even longer months researching each of the investee companies that we make. Um, now, one thing we have uh, in our company is we will generally invest, co-invest in these investments ourselves. So we'll invest alongside our investors and put our own money into these projects. So they're the projects that we really believe in, they're companies that we like, and they're in industries that are growing or have got tailwinds behind them. And our VC team are very experienced in investing in these type of companies. They've been doing it for, for many, many years. So the first thing I'd like to say is, you know, the VC component does not have to be high risk or it does not have to be in very volatile companies. Quite often, these companies are very well established, they're revenue producing, they're profitable in many cases, and they're just raising money in order to grow, to expand, for example. A lot of Australian companies are limited by the size of the Australian market. So they want to expand to the US or the UK, and they will use money, uh, they'll raise money from, from investors like us to allow them to hire sales staff and set up offices overseas and expand and sell their products to an overseas market, which of course is much larger than the Australian market. And could you give us, give us an example of, for example, a project that Morris has invested in? Um, how did that work out? Sure. So a really good example this year was a company we invested in around about March uh, of this year. Now, as you remember, I'm sure nobody will forget in March, COVID had hit um, and we had spent you know, almost four months speaking to this company, researching them, going through their accounts, the management, and we really liked the company. It was a company that we, we believed in um, and we wanted to invest in. But then, of course, COVID hit and the world seemed like it was going to be, the world was going to end. It was a disaster. Markets were falling everywhere. So what we had to do at the time was we had to make a decision. Do we want to proceed with the investment or do we want to or, or retreat? And... After careful consideration, the investment committee that we've got for the fund decided to proceed. And this business was a company called Citrus Ad, which is based in Brisbane. And their technology is, is used by supermarkets, online supermarkets in Australia, like Coles or Woolworths. Um, when you're shopping online, uh, it, it produces the technology that helps you find your products that you're looking for. Let's say a chocolate bar. You type in chocolate. The banner will show you the products that they've got, and it will promote certain products over others, like shelf space online. Um, so we invested in the company. Uh, we backed them at the time when they needed capital. They wanted to grow and expand. They were targeting international markets, including the UK. And since then, of course, as we know, during COVID, many more people doing online shopping, particularly for supermarkets, and the business has thrived. So it's done extremely well. It's doubled its workforce. And they've won some very big contracts from US and UK companies, including Sainsbury's, which is one of the big supermarkets there. So that's been a great success for us uh, and for the company. And it's allowed them to grow and expand and create jobs. And it's a really good case study of ways that the significant investor visa has benefited Australia. So it's helped Australia to grow, create jobs. And investors are also going to do very well from that company, which has now expanded 
uh, considerably since COVID. So how does that benefit investor? Like um, what I'm asking is basically the exit plan. So an investor, they want the money out. So how how's the return like if the company does well or who does who does who was company who don't do well? Sure. So in that case, typically what we'll do when we're investing in a in a company like this will be we will invest on a three to four year time horizon. So we're looking to invest. It's not a short term investment. We're investing over the, the medium term. And in this case, a company like this will have two options generally at the end of the of, of its um, in our investment period. They can list on the stock market, which many of them choose to do, or they get uh, taken out by another purchaser through a trade sale. So quite often, a bigger player in the market will come and buy them and buy their technology and buy their, their stuff and use them to expand their own. So either of those exits is quite likely. Now that exit, obviously, we have no control of when that happens. But what we'll try and do is we'll try and be actively involved in the business, actively involved on the board if we can. Um, to make sure that we can ensure that our exit happens in time for our investors who are all investing for four to five years, which is the term of their SIV program. So the timing should work out very well for them. Um, in the case of this company, it's hard to say, will it be a listing or a trade sale? But, you know, based on their growth to date, um, it certainly looks like an exit will, will happen in the next few years. And for it's, since it's called venture capital, there are risks, higher risks than the other investments. So... Sure. What if a, a company just uh, the, the investment fails? Correct. What will happen? And that can happen. You know, I, I would like to say, though, that um, under this component, venture capital is generally, uh, you're right, generally our startups, early stage ideas and concepts. But actually, it doesn't require you to invest in those cap companies. Private equity or growth private equity is actually typically closer to what we invest in. So these are companies that are already established, already revenue producing. Um, effectively, they've been through the early stage startup, which is the riskier time. Now, our investors, uh, as I mentioned before, are generally risk averse. So they want us to protect their capital. They want us to ensure that their money comes back at the end. So they're happy to take less risk um, and, and in return, a uh, slightly less return. So we will typically invest in later stage companies, growth private equity rather than venture capital. But venture capital is an option for investors. They can choose to invest in earlier stage companies, which typically would have a much higher return, but obviously a higher risk. Or they can choose to invest in later stage or growth private equity or expansion capital companies, which have lower risk, but will, should have a lower return as well. And investors can make that choice when they're choosing the fund to invest in for their, for their SRV. They will typically choose the fund that matches their risk and return per, uh, appetite or their profile. How did the past uh, performance of venture capital funds uh, Mollis has uh, invested in? How did that work out? Sure. So we've actually got a very good track record. Our investors have been very happy to date. Um, so our first fund, we're now on our second fund. The first fund closed in 2018. Um, and out of the 10 investments we've made, five have already exited. So we've returned our capital to investors. Um, now, it's very important to note that under the SRV program, the rules require you, when you get a return of capital and profits during the term of your four-year visa, you must reinvest them back into the complying investment firm, uh, program. So that means typically investors will get their money out of VC and they'll reinvest into something else. It could be bonds or equities or property. Um, and then that must remain invested until the end of their visa. But what that means from an investor's perspective is if you invest 500,000 on day one, quite quickly, you can start to get that money back and the VC component will reduce over time. Many investors, for example, will choose to put the money into bonds as soon as it exits from VC. And that reduces the risk profile of their investment considerably. So it is an option for you to, uh, as the money comes back, to reinvest it into something safer or lower risk like bonds. And many investors choose to do that. Okay. The second component SRV of the ICV framework is called small caps. Uh, the investor must invest $1.5 million into the ASX listed company uh, stock market, right? And that, is, uh, that has some restrictions. Um, how does that work? How does a small cap component work? Why does the government enforce that? Compared with the rest of the balance investment, how does that help uh, the economy and what's the return of the of the small cap investment like? Sure. 
Well, let me start with, with that part. Um, so in 2015, when the government revamped the significant investor visa program, they had a mandatory requirement for each investor to invest 10% into venture capital private equity and 30% into emerging companies or small caps. Now, the reason they did that is they wanted to direct more money into the productive economy to help stimulate the economy and help grow growing companies or emerging companies who would in turn create jobs and export and so on, help the Australian economy. So they had a mandatory investment in this case of, of 30% or 1.5 million into listed companies on the stock market, which were under $500 million market cap. So this component are, are listed shares, they're equities. Um, they, uh, there's a mandatory investment, you must invest at least that. You can invest more than if you like than 1.5 million, uh, but they're in listed shares on the stock market and they must be under $500 million at the time you first invest. Uh, now there's quite a number of rules applying to this section in terms of the amount of cash you can hold, the number of holdings you can have and the size of the companies, how big they can be. So in general terms, you need to choose a fund manager who, who can monitor this actively and actively manage it. In, you asked about returns. Um, this component obviously is higher risk than, than some other options out there. But in general, listed equities in Australia have had a very good performance over the media, especially over the medium to long term. So for most investors who are investing for their visa for four years, in general, these funds will have a positive return and should outperform other asset classes uh, like bonds, for example, over that time. Let's take, for example, last year. Um, so we have a very good case study this year of the first half of 2020 when we had COVID. Of course, at the time, the markets fell very dramatically in March as COVID first hit and countries went into lockdown, including Australia. But what we've seen since then is the markets have rebounded very strongly. The Australian economy is very well uh, prepared. We've handled COVID very well. And as a result, equity markets, including the small caps market, has rebounded strongly. And even last year, which included the last six months of the year, uh, our financial year here, which included COVID, you know, our fund, for example, was up 6.5% for the year, despite all of the turbulence. So our investors generally are quite happy uh, with this return. Their return for the second half of the year is going to be very strong as well. Uh, and most investors in this fund are, will be very pleased when they see the return that they've achieved during 2020. So how does Mollis decide on which product to invest in terms of the small cap? Do you have an analyst team? How do you decide which one is the best for the investor? We do. So uh, Mollis has a lot of experience in the small caps or listed small cap sector. We have a very strong research division, which covers, focuses exclusively on small cap companies. We cover more of them than anybody else. Um, and our fund manager for the fund, John Garrett, he's been doing this for many years. So very experienced in the area of equities and investing. Um, so he's a very careful investment strategy. Um, and his number one focus of this obviously is to protect Visa. So we must protect investors SIV. We must only invest in things which are allowed under the complying investment framework. And secondly, we must protect capital. So investors are generally want us to make sure that, that we return their capital to them safely after the four years is up. So the companies that John will invest in are good, solid companies that he has strong balance sheets, have got strong management alignments and are in industries that he believes have a strong future or have tailwinds behind it in Australia. Now, it's also a very diversified portfolio. So what that means is there's going to be more than 50 companies. When you invest in this fund, you will have exposure to more than 50 different companies in different sectors, in different asset classes and so on, which means you're spreading your risk across many different companies uh, over this 1.5 million component. So that's been our strategy from, from the beginning is a very thorough research driven um, selection process for the investee companies and a diversification. So we're spreading the risk across, you know, as I mentioned, over 50 different companies in this component. And that's proven to be a very, a very good strategy. It's, it's held up well during periods of turbulence such as COVID earlier this year. Okay, then the third, um, the remaining part, of, which is the balance investment, 3 million or less up to your choice. That's, that's usually the most profitable um, and uh, investors' favorites. Could you talk about that? Are there any restrictions at all? Uh, and what are the returns like in there? Sure. So the balancing investment is where investors have, have an element of choice. This is where they can choose uh, for 60% or for $3 million of the five what they invest in. 
Now your choice will generally be driven by your risk appetite, how much risk you like to take and how much return you're trying to achieve. So at one end, we've got corporate bonds, corporate bonds, particularly those issued by the big Australian banks, which is the majority of the market here, would be considered a very low risk or secure investment. Um, but at the moment, we find interest rates are very low in Australia, so the returns will generally be low as well, to, uh, along with the risk. So many investors in the last year, for example, prefer to invest in bonds, given the uncertainty and volatility in the market, which was uh, a valid option. Um, the other option investors can choose for this component is commercial property. So they can invest in a fund which invests in commercial property. And by that, I mean shopping centers, hospitals, uh, restaurants, hotels, uh, retail malls, offices, logistics, warehouses, this type of thing. So everything other than residential. Residential property is not permitted for this component of the investment. And investors at the moment, given interest rates are very low, commercial property had a very strong return over the last couple of years. So that's also a very popular option. And then finally, the other option investors can choose is listed equities. So they can invest in shares on the stock market. Um, and this doesn't have to be small companies. It can be large or small for this component. Um, but obviously, that would be a, a more volatile or higher risk investment. So investors who prefer lower risk would generally not choose to invest in listed equities for this component, but it is an option. The other thing to note is during the four year period of your visa, you are allowed to switch between investments. So you, for example, may start investing in bonds, you want to have a very start at the beginning with a more conservative portfolio. And then over time, as you get more familiar with the market, or more comfortable with Australia as an investment, you may switch from bonds across to equities or even property. Does a switch, so switch cost money? No, you can switch generally. If you're switching between funds with the same fund manager, generally you can do that at no cost. Um, but under the rules of the visa, you must do that switch within 30 days. So when you leave one fund, you must enter the next fund within 30 days. Otherwise, your visa may be impacted. Of course. So switching is permitted, assuming that the fund allows it switching out of the fund and into another is an option as well during the period of your visa. So you do have some flexibility. And the other thing to say for the component of the balancing is you don't have to put everything in one. You don't have to put all your money into property or into bonds. You can mix. You can put some in property, some in bonds, some in equities. And we have a number of investors who like that. They like to have a portfolio which is diversified across different asset classes and sectors, which means they're not too much too exposed to, to equity markets or to property markets uh, at any time. Uh, and it's a way of spreading their risk across um, different different asset classes. And how about the how about how how does the return look like, especially due to, due to COVID, and sure. also the law of interest rate? Um, on average, you know, the investors won't ask for what the investor looking for is an average return, uh, roughly okay. how much annual return would they generate? Some of them thinking they might be losing money. Is that the case? Sure. Well, certainly not. Even during COVID, we found that investors portfolios have held up very well. So if you invested in bonds, you know, they would have been rock solid during COVID. Um, the returns have, have reduced because interest rates have reduced here. But uh, you effectively have two choices. You can invest in fixed rate, which is, you know, as, as the name suggests, the returns are fixed for the term of the investment or floating rate, which is generally tied to the RBA cash rate uh, here, which is currently at record lows of 0.1%. So investors who, who invest in bonds right now, particularly you're looking at very secure bonds issued by the big banks, the largest companies in Australia, those bonds, you know, you're probably getting a return of about one to one and a half percent after all fees. Um, if you're happy to take a little bit more risk and invest in bonds issued by you know, you know, different companies or higher risk companies, you can get a, a higher return. But generally, the return on bonds will be low because the risk is low. Um, now, on the other hand, a commercial property fund, you know, you will be getting you know, somewhere between five, six, seven percent returns, depending on the asset class. So uh, it could be in offices or logistics buildings or hotels or retail malls. The, the returns on those um, investments will, will vary, but generally they'll be between five, six, seven percent returns on those, depending on the asset class. In per year, place. annual return. Per, per annum. Yeah, and, right. yeah. and then equities can be more volatile. It's very hard to predict equities. Some years can be high, some years can be low. Um, and it depends on the, on the sector or which particular sector you're investing in as well. Um, generally, equities is a, is a more long-term investment. So if you're investing in equities, we generally advise our investors to, 
to look at it as a medium to long term investment, not a short term one, because in the short term, it's very hard to predict anything can happen. But we know historically over the longer term that equities have performed very well here in Australia. I understand. In terms of the um, risk versus return, we all understand high risk, high return. So in terms of your uh, as a balance investment product you offer, could you list from a lower risk to a higher risk? Sure. If you look at the, the menu, and generally we'll have, at any one time, we'll be, have between seven or eight options for investors to choose for the balancing investment. Now, at the lower end ris- risk of the scale, you've got bonds. And even within bonds, there are different categories of bonds that you can choose. But in the more secure bonds or senior secured bonds, you're, you're looking at a lower return of, as I mentioned, one to one and a half percent. Um, the medium you know, risk would be commercial property. And again, you can reduce your risk in invest- investment property or commercial property by investing in you know, properties with long-term leases to good quality tenants. You know, For example, we've just got a logistics fund which invests in warehouses uh, or logistics distribution facilities, which is leased at the moment to a, on 15 years to a listed company. So very secure, rental income is locked in, guaranteed over 15 year period. So that's a, an investment which will be at the lower risk end of the commercial property scale. Okay. okay. Then finally, equities it would be what I would consider the highest risk. So equities um, can be volatile. It's you know, at the end of the day, the markets can sometimes be unpredictable, as we found out this year in March. Uh, but as I mentioned before, equities in generally over the medium to long term, equities have had a very positive return for investors. So as long as you're willing to take a long-term view on equities, it can be can deliver a very strong return. And in our case, our equity funds have actually been our best performing funds over the past five years. 